My name is Bill Hall, and I am a former pastor and writer and a discipleship evangelist. And for that reason, I'm going to talk with you a few minutes about the whole issue of what conversion and discipleship is and conversion's relationship to discipleship. Because the gospel, oftentimes people think, is simply about a decision and you get into heaven. Well, let me explain what I think that is a false belief about the gospel and why it's important to understand the gospel in all its fullness. Recently, there's a renaissance in the whole area of making disciples and of discipleship. But like Charles Dickens' famous novel, The Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. So it's the best of time in that there is this renaissance and we thank God for that. It's the worst of times in that we have some problems with our gospel. And there are many kinds of gospels that are preached in America and around the world for that matter. But what I'd like to talk with you today about is a clear way of understanding what it is. And what I believe that whatever the gospel is, that essentially it, when it calls us to salvation, it calls us all to discipleship as well. No exceptions and no excuses. In fact, the way I would explain this is simple, simply in a, uh, some drawings. The first thing that you'll notice is I'm just going to make a box, a simple box, and everybody agrees I have yet to met, meet the pastor or Christian leader who doesn't believe that making disciples is a priority, that this is really what it's all about. But also, most discussions about making disciples starts here with the commission that Jesus gave us. And you could understand why that would be the case. And so then the next thing is, okay, we need to have a vision. And the next person would say, we need to have models. Or we need to have a strategy. And so people, essentially the conversation is all around methods, ways to implement. Uh, if we can find people who are doing it really good, then we need to model that or follow that and learn from it. And that has its place. But a number of years ago, I met a Christian writer and philosopher named Dallas Willard. And when he mentioned to me one day that there was no theology of discipleship in America and anywhere in the world as far as he understood it, while it was there in the scriptures that nobody really had was clear about it and as a result it was costing us a great deal and it was creating a severe problem. And the problem that it was creating was that people believe and teach that you could become a Christian and not follow Jesus. Think about that. That's huge. That's a huge problem because essentially then anything other than getting saved and getting into heaven and having your sins forgiven was an option. Any, if you wanted to live for Christ, if you wanted to walk with him, if you wanted to be dedicated to him, then you would have to then add on something that you really don't have to do because it's not going to touch you whether or not you end up in heaven or not. And so as a result, many, many people don't take up the option on their contract. Additionally, pastors spend much of their ministry life trying to talk people into something, doing something, which is improve their game, be more dedicated and devoted, yet those people don't believe that they have to do it, that it's really necessary. And so what Dallas Willard and I talked about was there's a box above the box. And the box above the box is the gospel. Because the gospel that we believe in determines the kind of disciple we make. And that all of these downstream issues are important, but upstream at the source is the message that we have. And what does the gospel we believe in naturally lead to? 
Does it lead to people who are living for others, people who are dedicated to the agenda that Christ gave us, that he authorized us to do, to make and be disciples, and to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, and then the end would come? Or is it about how we're doing getting closer to God? Or the insulary way in which is non-reproductive discipleship plans that oftentimes are just based on this downstream. But you have to connect the gospel to the ultimate goal. But the gospel then is anyone who is called to salvation is also called to discipleship. No exceptions, no excuses. Now why is this important? The reason it's important is because let me draw some more boxes. This box is what we'd call our non-discipleship gospel. So the non-discipleship gospel then is going to create a disciple. And this disciple is going to be a reflection of what this particular gospel is. Now, most of the gospels that are preached in America today are about self or self-fulfillment or religious goods and services. And so we are so well trained as consumers that it's almost impossible for us to think outside of that consumer box. And so over here, we, let's say we have another box, and in this box we're going to put Christ-like disciple. If you start with a non-discipleship gospel and try to create a, a Christ-like disciple, you cannot get from here to there. That's the problem. So the problem is, what kind of people are we placing into the harvest field or into the community? What kind of people are we producing as a church? And essentially, you have to have a Christ-like gospel. But let me call it this, just for our purposes today, a follow-me gospel. Because essentially, this is about self, and Jesus was about others. That's the major distinction. Jesus said, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for others. And so that is why it really does matter what we believe the gospel is. Because the gospel, essentially, you cannot get from a non-discipleship gospel to a Christ-like disciple. And if that's what we're trying to achieve, then we have to switch from the gospels that the go, kind of gospel that we're teaching to one that naturally leads to a follower of Christ. Now there's a couple of other matters and for that we need to draw another picture. Just as the gospel needs to be for others in order to re, to produce disciples who live for others who are Christ-like in, the, in our country, and frankly, what dominates the entire Christian world is this. That a person starts down here, and they believe that up here is where they want to go. And so we say, if you'll practice certain disciplines, fasting, praying, giving, serving, uh, being missional, a whole list of things that would be spiritual disciplines that if you practice these then you will reach X which is the spot. The problem with this is no one ever really arrives because we realize that as we develop over the years that we find out more and more reasons why we're not a really a mature follower of Christ. And because this asks a question, how am I doing? 
How am I doing is the question that drives this paradigm. We call this the human paradigm. And it's a closed system, meaning that it does not reproduce. It cannot break out of the shell that it's in. It's the human paradigm. We call this the false promise of discipleship. It's a false promise because we say we can get from here to here by doing these activities and we don't get there. Now, what is the alternative? The alternative is to draw another circle and put a cross in the middle of it. And essentially, you see, these people think that discipleship primarily in this closed system and it'll solve all your problems essentially if you get closer to God. However, because you don't arrive, you don't really ever get as close to God as you think you ought to be, and you spend a lot of your, your life lamenting the fact that you aren't close to God, but you get up here, and the thing is, you've already arrived. Now, this is just more than theology, but it's you've already arrived, you're already close to Jesus. You can't get any closer than being adopted into his family. And so, essentially... It's about being aware then of all of what God has provided and accomplished in you. So X here marks the spot you don't get to. X becomes a cross. Now, what does this mean? How does this work out in any way that's definitively different? Well, we have another circle down here, and this circle is filled with other people. And these other people are the people that God has already put in your life. And so we have a different question. It's a question that Christ asked. And he was continually prodding his disciples with this question. And it is, how am I doing loving the people that God has already put in my life? That's the question. Because now these people are made up of different segments of our life like family. So we have uh, our family and we have our friends. We have uh, our spiritual family, our church, and we have what might even be called the people of peace. These are people that they're not followers of Christ, but they like us. They've invited us into their lives. And so the reason we state it this way, how am I doing loving the people that God has already put in my life? Because this word already gives you names and faces. Now, love is an ethereal kind of concept. But think about it back to the very origin. God is love, that simple statement. God is love is irrelevant unless God loves, unless he has someone to love. So God loves us, and he gave to us, he sacrificed for us, it's been demonstrated over and over again in our lives. So as a result, what we understand is that love is an action taken for the benefit of another person. So how am I, in very concrete ways, loving these people? My wife or my husband, my children, my extended family, my friends at church, the people that are my friends, the people who are, well, let's face it, sometimes are my enemies or my irritants. And then the people I work with and associates and the people in the neighborhood and the community. And if you are loving those people as Christ loved the church, then essentially what's going to happen is that if your love is Christ loved, then the least of your problems will be finding somebody who really wants to be around you, who wants to be attracted to you and the Christ in you. Now, here is a, another issue. Right here, we have what we might call the spiritual disciplines. 
So you say, what are the role of the spiritual disciplines? Well, the spiritual disciplines are in our life in order to create in us a Christ-likeness and qualities where we're willing to live for others that we can love these people. That's what makes sense. Now it all comes together. So you have really three big questions. How am I doing, which leads to a closed system that's non-reproducible. God, why, how can you be so good, which creates in me an awareness of all that God has completely done for me. And then out of that awareness, I'm asking myself this question, how am I doing loving the people that God has already put in my life? And as that happens, then I begin to understand the role of the Bible and prayer and fasting and silence and solitude and frugality and secrecy and all the other kinds of spiritual disciplines that God has introduced into us. But remember this, unless Jesus did it, don't bother with it. So this is what I think essentially is the message. The message is that if we are all called to salvation, everyone who's called to salvation is also called to discipleship. And as disciples, it's not about living for ourselves, it's about living for others. And as my friend Dallas Willard once said, if you take a funnel and you take all the discipleship principles and all the discipleship techniques and all the things we've all learned and you pour it into the top of a funnel and out of the bottom comes only one thing that's really of value and that's God's agape love. Love that's concrete and extending to others. And so I hope that you think about the problem and see what the solution is. And just to reiterate, the problem is that we believe in a gospel, oftentimes, and teach it, and it's quite too common that you can become a Christian and not follow Jesus. And that needs to be changed. Two, everyone who is called to salvation is called to discipleship, no exceptions, no excuses, and then we can move into this new realm of understanding what the gospel is and how it relates to other people. And as Jesus said, the worst kept secret in all the world, if you give up your life, you'll get it back.